Princeton University. Uh, the United States government has never been very good at picking technology winners. And so we've tried to evolve over time to public policies that provide incentives that are, that are technology blind and performance oriented. But now we have, we see this, uh, you know, the tax credit for the, mm -hmm. for the plug-in and, and all electric vehicles. And it, in this conference, there have been several papers that have questioned, you know, this, you know, there are problems with this technology that can't be ignored. And I'm wondering what the two of you think about the wisdom of this production tax credit idea, and uh, in, in particular, comment on, on the risk associated with the fact that uh, when we've had production tax credits in the past, and we go from one Congress to the next, these things are on again, off again. And in the case of wind power, for example, every time the production tax credit has disappeared, uh, the wind industry just is, is almost dies. Okay, and, and I'm wondering if you think there might be a significant risk that, say, the next Congress, you know, might uh, pull the rug on the production tax credit for uh, plug-in hybrids and all-electric vehicles and, and what that would do to, the, uh, to Detroit if, they, if it's going to uh, lead to another collapse of that, of that industry and would there be another bailout if, if, if that happened? Okay. So, Peter, I think you should answer that. <laughs> I work for the executive branch, so the legislative branch, uh, you know, we don't get into uh, critiquing them. We're, you know, we, uh, we answer their questions and try to provide uh, unbiased information in response to their questions. But uh, it's probably n not a qu good question for me to answer. But I, I think we do have a fearless observer here. Yes. So. Yeah, I, I think there's the two school two, two uh, schools of thoughts. I think one, you know, is concerned about you know the value of uh, deaths. You know, I think you need to uh, you know spur you know massive incentive to uh, to scale up production. You know, to overcome you know the barriers to bring down you know, the cost. Then you know the, the other thought, like what your argument, you know, you know you could uh, uh, make a wrong bet. You know. I, I think uh, you know. I, I for let's take a case of electric vehicles. I think the U.S. has uh, you know you know in the first wave of EV, you know, it's not very successful. Now this is a second wave, and uh, so definitely you know the second round, you know, definitely you know is it's from uh, all perspective, from uh, cost, uh, technology advancement. I think it's a bigger improvement for the first wave. But whether you know this is this, this is going to be successful, you know, I think. Uh, whether we may need a third wave for push, you know, I, I, you know, this is a very big question. So I think, you know, academic can argue that, you know, one, you know, you need a big spur of, uh, you know, infusion of, uh, you know, capital incentive to spur, you know, innovation. Uh, the other, you know, whether if what will happen if you, you know, have a wrong bet, you know, it's, uh, you know, that's like, you know, at the earlier, Dennis presented every five years, that can, you know, that's a new, new things come, you know, that's from biofuel to hydrogen, you know, to, all that. So I, I, I think, uh, I don't know, I think uh, maybe, um, I guess we just keep trying for different <laughs> options to find my, until we find the, you know. But whether, the other argument is whether there's going to be opportunity cost. I think that's a you know, real argument. You know, if you spend uh, too much money on one technology, then you fail. Whether that, if there's no opportunity cost, you know, maybe, you know, just keep trying for different things until, you know. I, I guess that's my thought. I'm not sure that's right. <laughs> Ben, can I maybe follow on from, from that question on electric on EVs? Um, it, it, and I think your, your presentation was really fascinating on this, that really if there's ever a, a something in transportation that the US and China has in common, it's the introduction of EVs and how that will impact the grid and, and so on. Um, is, it, is it possible that EVs can be grown at the same time as renewable energy can be grown because there's a natural kind of fit there if we, we can balance the, the unpredictable uh, g power generation with, with a more predictable and a flexible load perhaps. So would you like, care to comment on that? Is it possible these two things can grow in parallel somehow? Yeah, I, I think I, you know, 
In some, in some area, you know, like in France, you know, 85% of the power generation is from nuclear power. Definitely EV is, uh, you know, is very clean, super clean. Also in California, there's no power, no coal power generation. So I think in some areas, it makes a lot of sense to promote EVs. I, I think in China, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, possible. There's a study underway whether uh, you can charge the battery, you know, I think during the evening, during the night, then, you know, the renewable energy, uh, you know, making renewable energy more available. So I think there's a, uh, but there's a challenge of that. I think all these things, I think it's gonna take years. I think for China, you know, the first thing you need to clean up the power grid, you know, then it's gonna take a, I think all this, um, like my argument is, you know, definitely, you know, this is something definitely China need to, to, to pursue, you know, uh, to promote the electric vehicle, you know, it's, it's nothing wrong with that. It's just uh, you need to, to manage them, you know, you, to, you need to have a, you know, right uh, thinking, you know, uh, you know, you can't just, uh, you know, I know that, uh, you know, like uh, Beijing want, want to uh, also want to uh, deploy, you know, you know, EVs, which is not, a, may not be a good idea as, uh, you know, Shenzhen and some part of China, you know, which relies on uh, more renewable energy. So I think you have to have a system thinking. I think like we have to get sophisticated, you know, you can't just, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, have to have a modeling, you have to have a detailed analysis, devil is in the details. So I think that's very important for the, for the researchers, the academics, really to tell the decision makers, you know, if you want to do this, you want to do that in the right way, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Is there another question from the audience? I, I did get permission from Mark Vanazak Hole to run over time a little bit, so uh, if, this is a good opportunity. Yes? Well, one of the solutions to the problem you suggest is just to provide general incentives for outcomes. And I think one of the things that I mean, I think of this from the safety side in particular, but it seems to me that one of the ways to do this is simply to provide incentives to achieve those goals and leave it up to the innovators to figure out how to achieve it. And there's two ways you can do that. One of them is you provide an incentive for um, uh, buying a let's just say, buying a fuel-efficient car, and the more fuel-efficient it is, the more the incentive is. The other one is the one that's really, really popular. I know it's problem, popular with your boss. It's a tax. So you simply raise the cost of fuel. Funny how the Europeans have beaten the pants off us, the Japanese have beaten the pants off on us, because we didn't have any reason to save fuel because fuel was cheaper than water. So um, the the... There are many ways to skin the cat. And if it costs more to buy fuel, innovation will follow. Yeah, I might just comment that in the um, 2012 budget proposal, there's a transportation leadership awards program proposed that would very much along these lines reward I mean, reward communities and innovators uh, at whatever level to develop transportation solutions that do meet outcome-oriented criteria, kind of like the TIGER program that I described, which was why I described it. And I think that's, that's the direction that we're interested in going at the DOT. Of course, a lot of the, the, this huge topic that we've been addressing, it's not just the US DOT who's, who's involved. It's very, very importantly the Department of Energy um, and many others. So our, our niche in there, I think, you know, we're, we're with you on this idea of uh, incentives. Robert, I just just one that occurs to me, if I may, the um, I think we've heard a little bit today that uh, when it comes to eco driving or safe driving, in in a sense they're one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. So we have different sectors, policy wise, maybe we're trying to uh, maybe obtain the same objective at the end of the day. Um, so to what extent do you think? And, and a lot of this may be done through training and all kinds of technologies in vehicles and all that sort of thing. But to what extent do you think? There would be policy solutions, and I, such as speed adaptation, things like that. How realistic? What sort of time frame would we be talking about? Well, again, thinking about the, the transportation system, there are speed harmonization systems. Uh, the state of Washington has recently installed one that's an uh, infrastructure-based uh, speed harmonization system. Of course, they have them uh, in Europe, uh, many places. Basically, a variable speed limit system. So. You want the drivers to comply with the speeds that are, are being uh, dampened to uh, basically to eliminate um, uh, 
well, to prevent crashes on the, on the freeway. Um, I mentioned that safety is our number one priority. The advantage is if you prevent a crash on a freeway during a peak period, uh, not only are you preventing the crash and benefiting from it that way, but you're also uh, reducing um, congestion, you're reducing fuel consumption, re reducing emissions. So we view that a lot of good things flow from a safer system. So mm -hmm. that's sort of the big picture. Mm -hmm. um, drilling down into our ARIS program, we include a, a set of applications that include basically an eco-driving application, and we're over the next year or two developing the concept of operations for that system um, that will include a very strong evaluation component. Um, we envision this future of connected vehicles having sustainability-related applications. Exactly when those vehicles uh, are on the road um, is a complicated question to answer, but I think it will be relatively soon. I mean, in 2013, um, our, our sister agency, NHTSA, is planning to make a regulatory decision about requiring these communication devices in vehicles. So it could be a few years after that that vehicles start appearing that would have the capabilities to do these kinds of things, such as the the driver, uh, the smoothing um, mm -hmm. component that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So I think it's on the horizon. Okay, well that's good. A good connected vehicles, a good a good note to perhaps end on, unless there's a burning question. If not. I want to thank uh, Dr. Robert Bettini, please join me in thanking, and also Dr. Feng and for their great presentations. I think uh, this was really a pretty powerful session. So please join me in thanking them. Thank you.